chapter 16 and I'm going to go to verse 1 and we are talking about actually the subtitle to this is going to be the secret to releasing abundance in the kingdom or you can title it hopefully you're taking notes kingdom stewardship understand real quick the entire kingdom runs on stewardship in the kingdom of God you cannot earn what God has for you but you can qualify for it there's a difference. Now, you got to understand, there's a difference. If you're going to have the abundance you need to fulfill what God has called you to do, take care of your kids the way he wants you to do it, be an example of his kingdom as he wants you to be, and, and be successful in the world, you're going to have to have the, abundance, uh, the uh, abundant resources to do it. Being saved is not enough. A lot of saved people are struggling. Okay, and God does not want that. So... He's going to reveal to you more as the series goes on. How many of y'all just, you don't got to say you're struggling, but how many of y'all just want to make sure everybody's not struggling? Amen. Just, I don't want my neighbor to struggle. I don't want them to struggle. My, my family, my kids to struggle. I don't want anyone to struggle. So we got to grab this. All right. So let's look at the story Jesus tells about stewardship of the kingdom. Luke chapter 16. Let's go with verse 1. I'm going to try to get it up here. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to read it off of the screen. He also said to his disciples, now again, Understand who he's talking to? Disciples. He says to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he has a steward and he's wasting the goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Again, I walked through this a little bit with you. If you want to get God's attention, start wasting his stuff. And he will come check it. Okay. So it's, it's, not, it's not good to be wasting his stuff. That wakes God up. God's like, wait a minute, we're going to have to check this now. So you see the story. This is Jesus now. This is not me. Don't get mad at me. Jesus is saying this. Okay? What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Now here, I want you to understand too, giving, giving an account is biblical. Some people have been in church and heard that because of grace, we no longer give accounts. But Jesus is saying when it comes to your spirit, you have passed judgment. But when it comes to your stuff, I'm checking it. I know that you're saved, but your stuff is not. Being saved has nothing to do with the account of the stuff. Okay? So, anyway, you got to understand, there is an account that is held, and God is checking what we are doing with what he gave us, right? Okay, so the steward says to him, what shall I do for my master's taking the stewardship away from me? So Jesus says, you can no longer have the stewardship. So the things that we are operating with and the resources that we have, they are subject to a check. How much we get to manage is subject to a check. It's subject to stewardship. Watch this as Jesus talks about it. Okay, he's going to take the stewardship away from me. Now, now understand, losing the stewardship doesn't mean that you lose your uh, righteousness. All right, but you can lose the stewardship of stuff. I got to separate those things. He says, I can't dig. I, I'm ashamed to beg. I don't have no skills. You know, how will I resolve what to do? When I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive, so that people may receive me into their houses. Okay, keep going. I'm going to go quickly through this. So he called everyone uh, of his master's debtors and said to him, now how much do you owe the master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said, all right, so take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. So he cuts it in half. Next one. Then he said to the other one, how much do you owe the master? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to them, take your bill, write 80. Then the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of, the light, uh, of light. So, all right, just this point real quick. So the man knows the, the master's principles already. He knows the rules of the stewardship. How come he wasn't doing the dealing this way before? Because he was stealing the money. So it's more profitable to keep the people thinking that their bill is higher than it is because I'm stealing the money anyway. 
You see that? But he knew that the master was, you know, when you settle a bill, sometimes they'll cut a deal with you, won't they? So you call and say, I want to pay this off. And they say, well, okay, you can pay this amount today and you're done with it. Listen, he knew the rules of the stewardship. And Jesus says, now I will tell you this. You're still an unjust steward, but here's what I want my disciples to grab. The people of the world are better at their game than people of God are at the kingdom. He said, here's what you can glean from this. Listen, they are skilled and they are building things and they are developing their world and they are having success because they are wiser at their system and they're executing their plan better than the kingdom of God and the citizens of the kingdom are executing God's plan. And it really doesn't come down to which system is better. We know God's is, God's is better. It's about execution of the system. And people don't want to execute God's system. And we don't realize that we are actually trained in our mentality to forfeit what God has given us. The world has trained you to give it up. So he's saying you got to get wise in God's system. And you better execute your plan better and God's plan better than they're executing theirs or you will always be subject to what they do. So he says they are more shrewd and deal more wisely than my children in my system. Okay, keep going. And I say to you, make friends of yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, or actually the translation actually says when it fails, when the world system fails, that they may receive you into everlasting homes. He who is faithful in what is least, this is a good principle, is also faithful in much. All right, so look at the key words because I'm going to explain a, a few of these today. Faithfulness is the key here. He said a person who is faithful is faithful. Okay, it has nothing to do with how much they have. Are they faithful? Do they realize how the kingdom works? Okay, and then he says, but he who is faithful in least is also faithful, uh, or who is not faithful in least is also faithful in much, and he who is unjust in what is least. Okay, he moved, <laughs> he moved my scripture. All right, anyway. You get my point. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will give you or trust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Amen. Another quick little point to this I'm reviewing right now. So another quick point to this is, is that God is checking on, can you even be faithful with someone else's stuff before I give you your own? So God's plan is to give you true riches. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? But what is true riches? I explained last week. Riches is not the money. Riches is the position. Because the word rich doesn't even mean money. The word rich actually is the word for ranking. We call it rich. We pronounce CHs as, uh, the, with the ch sound. But it comes from a Latin word that, mean, that has a K sound. So it's really reich, not rich. Where we get our word rank. So he's saying... If you get into the right position in the kingdom, if I can trust you here, I can move you here. And there's different levels and different benefits with different places. And he says, I got a place for you, but I can't put you there yet because you haven't learned how to serve and steward things when it wasn't your full responsibility and you was under somebody else. Can you imagine? You're late for the thing God's asking you to do now and you're not even doing a big job. How can I move you into what I really, I mean, God's got something for you. And sometimes we just overlook the importance of stewarding the place that we're in, and we don't realize we can bang our head against the wall, go get two more degrees, stress yourself out, and God will keep you right there. He's like, yep, you're just stressing yourself for no reason. You, it's about the stewardship of what you got. Okay, we getting the principles? Okay, now keep, keep going. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, so there's two masters to choose from. It's God and it's money. The devil don't say the devil because he knows you're too, you're too cool for that. You'll catch that. So they, so they call it money. So the devil uses the money because he knows you won't say, you know, Jesus said you can't serve God and the devil. He said, well, certainly I wouldn't serve the devil, but we think the money is not the devil. The money itself is not, but the devil's game is to get you in love with the money. All right, can we keep going? Now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, what do they love? Money. They love money. He, they uh, also heard all these things, and they derided him and, and said to him, you, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is abomination to the Lord. All right, keep going. This is, now, watch how Jesus wraps it up just to make sure you understand what he's talking about. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached. 
and everyone is pressing into that system. All right, so he says, now religious people are teaching, they love money. So he says, now I'm closing out a season. It used to be the law and the prophets guided you. He said, but that's over now because the kingdom of God is here now. So you can press your way, get in this system now and understand that it works by stewardship. Okay, so you got to understand how God's kingdom works. It works by stewardship. Go to um, go to first Timothy chapter six. My goodness, I got to hurry up now. Godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. How many of y'all know that's true? What does that mean? Everything you have, you're not taking it with you. So what is he saying? You're not here to save yourself. You're here to manage it because you cannot take it. You didn't bring it. You can't take it. Money ends up in the hands of managers. So people that think they can take it, they're fooling themselves. He's just making it plain right here. And having, uh, okay, so um, having food and clothing, these, with these we shall be content. Keep going. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Notice it's not those who are rich. It's those who have the wish of riches. He said godliness is great gain. Content with being godly is great gain. He said, but there's a lot of people who don't care much about being godly, and they just want to be rich. You should write that down because I'm coming somewhere with that in a second. Okay, so he says, now, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. That's, let me tell you something. That will get you every time. And into foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Keep going. For the love of money is the root of all kind of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greeting. Let me tell you something. I don't care what religion you are or what religion you ever were. Money will make all religious people leave that so-called religion. Muslims will leave, you know, Islam for money. Christians will leave Christianity for money. It doesn't matter. Whoever's got the money is where they're going to go. That's how powerful this stuff is. So he says it doesn't matter. You're going to leave your faith anyway. You get enough money, and then people are going to leave what they got going on. Trust me. All right. So. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, can you go to Ecclesiastes? I'm giving you scriptures. Hopefully, you're writing them down. 10, 19. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. What answers everything? Money answers everything. When your bill collector calls, what do you got to give them? Money. Your Christianity means nothing to them. And the Bible is telling you, Stop doing that. You got to have some money, people. They're not going to just give it to you because they feel sorry for you. And you can't pray to God long enough and God say, you know what? For you, you don't have to pay for the power. Everybody else got to pay, but you don't. See, we, 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 just, we just got our minds so far. We just, we, we're either afraid of it or we're in love with it. Some people are like, oh, God, I don't want to talk about money. We got to talk about money. Okay, so now let me give you just uh, what this means. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry. Okay, but money answers everything. This is what this really means. Let's write this down. Everything requires money to be successful. Everything, churches, businesses, your family, everything requires money to be successful. Money answers everything. So if you are going to fulfill what God has called you to fulfill, you're going to have to have the answer. What is the answer? Money. Okay. I'm, I'm reading the Bible. Y'all looking at me like I just made that up. What about Jesus? You know, <laughs> Jesus is telling you in the other story, it's money. I'm t- he's like, I'm telling you, the, the fella I had with me carrying the money, he stole the money. Because he knew the money answered everything. You know, Judas, he stole the money. Right? He betrayed Jesus for some money. He slipped them coins in his pocket. He's walking with Jesus. This man has no fear. Jesus is walking on water and he's stealing his money. I'm not stealing that guy's money. This guy's reading people's minds. He turn around and say, I know what y'all thinking. And you're stealing the money like he ain't going to know. 
Somebody say stewardship. God knows what you're doing with it. Oh my God. Okay. All right. So now everything requires money to be successful. Now let me hit these notes. Are y'all okay? All right. We shouted and we went a long time on the announcement. So now I get to preach. First thing we are learning is about the spirit of stewardship because I'll give you some more details in terms of little things about uh, practical things about stewardship, but I got to get you to understand the concept. Number one, mankind doesn't really know that they are stewards. We don't act like stewards. And the reason why is because we're trained in an antichrist system, meaning anti-God or anti-anointing or anti-kingdom. Okay? The system you were raised in to get that job, they didn't teach you stewardship. This is why people are, you know, high blood pressure and everything else trying to keep a job, worried and stressed if they get laid off from a job. That's not God's original system. So you don't think like a steward. That's why you're worried. That's number one. People are, I hope y'all getting this. People are raised to short circuit heaven's abundance in their life. So heaven is trying to govern the, the affairs of earth, but we have been trained to short circuit what God is doing. That's the whole game. The devil knows money answers all things. And so he trains us in a system to where we think we're going to get some money. But how many of y'all went to school and know when you get out, they ain't going to guarantee you no money? They're going to guarantee you're going to owe some. But they're not guaranteeing you're going to get some. Why? Because the system, it's not a conspiracy. It's a reality. They are, listen, the devil is behind the details. And I'm telling you right now, there's a whole different system. But our mentality is short-circuiting that system. We were trained to short-circuit what God was trying to do from the first. He's not holding money from you. The Bible says he would not withhold any good thing from you. It's just you don't know the key to get the money. I'm only talking about money right now. Stewardship covers everything, but I'm talking about money, okay? So this wasteful lifestyle, it must stop, or we will not be able to create a stable and sustainable life for ourselves and fulfill our callings. We will continue to be unstable. You will continue to be shaky. You will continue to dread the first of the month. You will continue to sweat it out by hard Labor. You will continue to hate going to work. You will continue to flounder around in the system because this was not the place you were supposed to originally function in. That world was not supposed to be your world. The kingdom of God was where you were supposed to function. So life is always hard when you don't understand stewardship because that is the original concept for man. People love money so much they will do anything for money. People will lie for money. People will steal for money. People will lie when they have money and say they don't have money because they love money. You walking in the bank or walking in the gas station, you got your wallet with you. You got a few dollars in there. The guy's like, you got some change? You're like, oh, no, nah, I, mean, I, ain't, I ain't got nothing today. Why? Because you love your money. Lie about having it. Christian, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I lied about that one time. And I lied so fast that I stopped and went back and gave the man some money. Listen, listen, I, it happened so quick, I didn't even mean to lie. The answer, the answer should have just been, I ain't giving it to you. That's to be real. But I usually do, but, I, but, you know, I try to let God tell me yes or no. I don't always do it, but sometimes I, do. I just try to see what God is saying. So, so, so. I, but I didn't have to say I don't have it. I just walked by, and I don't remember how I said it, but I got in the gas station. I said, what am I doing? The Holy Ghost was like, you lying? I was like, I did lie. How did I lie so fast? See, y'all don't look at me like that. Sometimes you lie so fast, it just came out. You didn't mean to. Am I by myself? I didn't mean to say I didn't have I meant to say something else. Okay, so, so, so. we lie about money. Not on purpose. That was just a quick one. But my point is, people will do anything. People will sell themselves out for money. People will lay down with people for money. People will sell out friends for money. People will throw you under the bus for money. People will extort you for money. Money is powerful. It's a powerful influence. The world system teaches you to chase the money, but that system is defective. I'm continuing. I hope y'all are grabbing this. I want to give now I'm going into a little little deeper as I get on this, okay? But God wants you to have abundance. But remember last week we learned that even though we're asking God for the abundance that He has for us, God doesn't have the money. God doesn't have money. So we need to understand that where is your money? Your money is in an account. 
already in an account. So God sends Adam to the earth, and he gives him the account of heaven to do his business. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, God said, let them have my account. Or he says, let, let them have dominion over all that I've created. Yeah. This man was a steward of God's creation. So he says, now, Adam, you have access and stewardship to everything in the heavens and in the earth. I, you have access to every secret. You have access to every powerful thing spiritually. You also have control of the wealth naturally. Adam was born naked, but he was born rich. Yeah. People look at Adam and say he was born with nothing. But you don't realize that not having anything in your pockets, or not even, he didn't even have pockets. The man was rich. Why? Because he was in position with God. He was a son of God. That's what stewardship is. A steward doesn't worry about what's in his pocket. Because anything I get a hold of, I know I'm here to manage it. My life doesn't depend on, you know, how much money is in here. My life depends on what I'm connected to. I'm serious. So you got to make sure you understand stewardship because most people are moving themselves out of the provision thinking that they're chasing the provision. I'm chasing money and you're moving yourself. I'm holding money. I'm keeping God's money. I'm just handling it wrong. And really, you're moving yourself out from under the stewardship. That's right. That's right. Because money will change. You don't want to rob God today and mess up a blessing that was coming later. Because you had an emergency today. And I've been in many emergency, emergency cases, and I still give my money exactly how God said to give it. And I thank God I did, because later down the road when that emergency came due, God took care of it. Right? So you need to understand, stewards think this way. God invested everything into the account. What is the name of the account? It's the king's dominion, or we can say it's kingdom. Why does Jesus always talk about the kingdom? Because that's the account you have to live from. He invested all power and authority into this new kingdom, Christ's kingdom. So you have to be in Christ, in that kingdom, to have access to it. You also have to know how to make the transaction. You can't just, okay, I'm a Christian. A lot of Christians are struggling. How do I make a legal exchange? It's in stewardship. Okay, are we getting that? Okay, so the kingdom, so God don't have your money, it's in the kingdom. The problem is kingdoms, like all governments, have laws. If you don't know the law, you can be rightfully, the heir rightfully to everything God has and die of starvation on the street. Mind-blowing. You are rich. Adam had nothing. Maybe you're in here today, you don't have anything. Adam had nothing. But he was rich. And Adam traded the real rich, true riches that Jesus, he traded his rank, his position with God for more knowledge. Are you hearing me? So Jesus came to restore true riches. He don't want us just to, now money is good. Money answers everything. But the true riches is what causes the money to come to you. All right, I'm going to get into that. So y'all here? Okay. Jesus came to restore true riches. Kingdom living and stewardship is where the true riches are. Let me throw a couple of these on the screen. Matthew chapter 19, verse 24. Watch this. Again, I, now this is quoting Jesus. Jesus. So make sure everybody understands that. He says, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter what? He's not talking about heaven. I'm drilling that. He said, it is harder for a man of high rank in the world system to operate in the kingdom. Why? Because he has learned principles that don't work in my system. So many people are studying the world system, going through the world schooling, come into church and like, I don't understand that giving and tithing and sowing and reaping and all of that stuff. Why? It's not your fault other than the fact that you have been trained not to understand this system. Jesus said it's harder for a man who has reached a successful level in the world system to get into and function in God's kingdom. By the way, Jesus said the kingdom is on the earth. So that is not talking about going to heaven through the pearly gates. I know that's what religion has taught you. Jesus said, hey, I put you here to administrate my kingdom on the earth. I want my kingdom to be functioning on the earth so we can have a thriving life. I want it to be on earth as it is in heaven. That's the plan. When I put Adam on the earth, it was so we could have heaven on the earth. So he says, it's harder 
the higher you go in the world system to start understanding. And, and, and by, by the way, that's very relative. You know, some people get $1,000 and they think they got something. They start acting crazy. Right? Tax time, you drive. What? You see people? On, my Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. Jesus said, this is how the kingdom works. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, seek first my kingdom, and all of these things are being added. Again, not talking about sending you to heaven. You struggle for where we're going to eat, where we're going to live, what we're going to drink. He said, learn the kingdom. Seek it first. That means study, understand it. Make sure you're under a steady flow of kingdom teaching constantly so that your brain can be reprogrammed so you can function in the new system because it's different than the one you're in. The reason we have lack and want, a steward never lacks and wants unless he loses his keys. A steward gets keys to the vineyard. Principles that cause it to work. He knows how to till the ground. He's a master of his domain. He knows how to make it fruitful. He knows how to make it abound. A, key, a steward never starves unless he steals the vineyard from the master or he loses his keys. Meaning you don't know how the principles work. That's the only reason you're in the situation you're in, whether it's good or bad. You may feel pretty good about where you are, but I promise you God's got more. You may feel bad about where you are. God's got more. What do we got to have? The keys of the kingdom. He says, seek first. Not the world system. First priority, know the kingdom. Now when you're in the world, you won't be dependent on it. Because when it fails, and it will, and it is, you won't be affected. Being a steward protects you from the world's failures. Being a steward, y'all remember in 07, 08, the housing collapse, market collapse? I didn't even know what happened. That was some, like, when, I'm telling you, those are some of my best years. Amen. I mean, I know some people went through it, but you know what? I continued, I got aggressive on the giving. I got aggressive on, I made sure my tithe was good, number one, and then I got aggressive on sowing seed. Because when I see stuff start to go down, I got to make sure I got seeds in the ground. Because I'm smart like that. You, got, you know, you got to start thinking steward. Steward is, wait a minute, I understand. I got to get some seed in. Because in the future, it'll be there for me. God can't bless what we put in our pocket. It's got to get in the ground. Amen. I think got to keep moving. Okay. All right. Where am I at? My Lord. The devil is a lie. That clock is a lie. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. Again, I just want to drive this home. The kingdom system is like. Jesus said it's like. Anytime he's explaining the kingdom, he explains, he gives you something to compare it to. The kingdom of heaven is like. A landowner, he said, here's how it works, y'all. It's like a landowner who went out early in the morning and got laborers for his vineyard. The word laborers is steward. Amen. So God owns it all and we manage it. If our lives and our house, let's say we have a landlord, right? If, you, if you're a renter, you have a landlord or if you've ever rented, you know. Okay, now the landlord owns the property. The steward controls and manages the property. If you mismanage the property... Long enough, the landlord is going to get a report. The HOA is going to give him an email, and he is going to say, let me go check on my stuff. And if your house is nasty and junky and there's rodents running around in it, and the landowner finds out, he might take it away. And we got to realize that it's not the, la the, the landlord, landowner is not evil. He's running his kingdom the way he designed it to run. What was the issue? The issue was my stewardship of it. The issue was how I carried it. The issue was, did I, did I clean it? Did I manage it? Did I sweep it? Okay? And it's a constant work. I got two little kids. It's constant work. We clean the whole house top to bottom. Five minutes later, if you walked in, you'd be like, y'all some nasty people. We got toys everywhere. We got to clean it again, though. When it gets dirty, clean it again. Listen, it's not the landowner. It is the stewardship. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? All right. Now I'm going to go a little bit more practical for the rest of my time here. Y'all okay? Shift around in your seat if you're feeling antsy a little bit because i got a couple more points to make. How, do, how, how does a steward function? Because we got to remember the spirit of stewardship. Stewardship is a legal position. Stewardship is a ranking. Stewardship is being ruler of another king's property. How does a steward function? A steward is, he has no worries about his own life. 
A steward has no worries about his own life. This is why. Because a steward has his affections set on managing what he has been given. He doesn't even have time to worry about his own life because his affections are not on his life. His affections are on what the the Lord has given him to manage. When you start worrying, it's because you have pulled your life away from God. And now God is the one that's supposed to be taking care of you, but you have decided to take God's role. Jesus tells a story about the guy who had the vineyard and hired the laborers. What happened when God sent people to check on the vineyard? They killed them. They threw them out. They took the vineyard from the master. They said, we're going to have this vineyard. We're going to declare independence. And when you do that, you are on your own. And that's where fear and worry set in. When you are a steward and you think like a steward, you don't worry. Because now the pressure is on the government that sent you to do that work. It's not on you. Time and time again, I have seen people worry themselves right out of their blessing. You can't sow your seed and then worry. Jesus said, do not worry. That wasn't a suggestion. That's a command. Worry, short circuit my kingdom. When you sow it, understand I'm a steward. God's got to back me up. Now I'm under his treasury, under his defense, and under his hand. And God owns everything. So it doesn't matter. I could have a zero in my pocket, but if I gave what God told me to give, there was a time in my life where I had some money and and God said, give everything in your pocket. Me and my wife sitting in a church service and I said, okay, Lord, it's his. Now, there was a time when, when I heard that, I was like, I don't know about that. But I learned how to think like a steward. Every time God asked me to give up something, it's because he's got something bigger in mind. So that's the truth. So listen, we gave it up. Let me give you a better example. One time, I needed a new car, okay? I said, God, I don't want car payments. I want a paid-for car. He said, here's what you do. Find somebody. He told me what to do. He said, find somebody that has all their stuff paid for, debt-free, a paid-for car, and bless them. So I looked around for a seat. I had 50 bucks. I said, I need a, I said, I need a car paid for. So I found a guy. I looked around. I found a guy who I knew a little bit about him. It was a friend of mine's dad, actually, older guy. I, gave, I went in church. Now, he don't know anything about this kind of stuff. He's in church, but he, you know, he, don't really, he don't really get it. So I walked up to him. Praise and worship going on. There's music going on. I walked up to him, and I said, hey, sir, and I shook his hand, and I put the $50 in his hand, and, I, and, and the guy, my friend, he said, when you do that, you're going to have to run away because he don't really need any money. You're going to have to run, or he ain't going to take it. So I put it in his hand, and I, and I took off. Less than a week later, a man called me. And said, hey, I don't even know why I was thinking about you. I brought you a Jeep. With no payments. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, and I'm paying your insurance for a couple years too. Random. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and I needed a car at the time. Are y'all here? All right, listen, I'm telling you, when you become a steward, you don't have to be limited to what your job can do. That's only one channel. But you still got the hand of God, the providence of God working in your life. But that's only if you know how to steward. You could be doing way more than you're doing. It really can change. But that fear is going to try to hold you back. You got to think like a steward. Somebody say, I'm going to think like a steward now. This ain't my money. You need to just think about how much money you got. And just just say this to yourself. That ain't mine. That's for God's kingdom. Okay? Just think of it that way. All right. So. How does a steward function? He is responsible for executing the king's intention for all that he was given. What is the king's intention? When he was given the land and when, he's, when you have been given anything, you're not there to survive in it. You're there to execute God's intention with it. So what that means is what's God's intention? I want to expand my culture to all the world. I want my glory to fill the world and the earth as the waters cover the sea. That means I want kingdom culture everywhere. I want people to see kingdom All over their life, I want want you to go into the world and be a witness of my kingdom everywhere. That's what you use your wealth for. Okay? And so God wants to give you so much that you can survive on what you got, you know, have your lifestyle, but also have more than you need. Why? Because his goal was not for you to survive. His goal was for you to become an impact and to expand what he gave you. When God gives you a seed, he's trying to tell you that, listen, a steward knows that my job is not to eat this. My job is to multiply it. Thinking like a steward, when you get a seed, see, a servant just eats everything they give him. A steward finds places to put it so it can grow. I taught my daughter this very simply. I said, honey, I'm going to tell you this rule. Money is very sad. And I, made it, I made it like a person. I said, money will be very sad if you don't handle it right. She said, okay, what do you mean? I said, okay, money wants to grow. 
The greatest desire of money is that it can grow. I said, so you got to put money where it can grow or to be very sad. Money in your pocket is worthless. So I said, until you put it in somebody else's hand, you can't get anything they have. You can't get, you can't get bread at the grocery store until you make the exchange. Money in your pocket is worthless. Make you feel good, but worthless. Money in your account is worthless. It's doing nothing. It's depreciating. It's worth nothing. So he said, now, you got to be wise. You need, I said, you got to find places to put it. Where's the first place you put it? I taught her. The first place you invest is in the kingdom. That's the first place. Tithes are first. Just so we know where, where this thing comes from. Tithes are first. Money wants to grow, but you got to find a place to put it. A steward, a steward knows it might be zero in the account, but I might have assets everywhere making money for me. Money in the account makes you feel better until you become a steward. Money going out there to work every day makes me feel better. <laughs> I like to dabble in little businesses and things like that. And you know what? When the money starts working, I, that makes me feel better. I don't know if this is helping. All right. A steward is responsible executing the intention of the king. Your intention made to be survived. God's intention is for it to grow. The beginning of stewardship in your mind is realizing that God owns everything. Where, when do you start becoming stewardship thinking? When you realize that God owns everything. Throw these quick scriptures on the screen for me. Deuteronomy chapter 10. God, somebody said God owns everything. When you remember that, that means you know, I, actually, what I'm holding, God is checking what I'm doing with it. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to who? The Lord. And also the earth and all that's in it. That's everything. Who does it belong to? Your house belongs to the Lord. Your car belongs to the Lord. Amen. The ground you're standing on, the rocks Amen. under your feet. The road you drive on, the air you're breathing, the trees, the animals, the birds and the fish, the paper that your money was printed on belongs to the one who made it. It belongs to the Lord. You can't think like a steward until you realize that God owns it all. I know. See, again, we've been trained not to know that our leaders own everything because we live in a system that doesn't have a king. Kings are personal owners of everything in the kingdom, everything. Every bird that flies by is the king's property, so if you kill it, they'll get you. Every fish in the water belongs to the king. So if you kill one of the fish without permission, you have stolen from the king. Amen. That has not changed. I don't care if people make systems and now we have democracies in other countries and nations. We got these fancy names on the map and we say this is this country and this and this. And God said, all of y'all stealing. That's all mine. Y'all yeah. all, right. all thiefing. Listen, that's my stuff. Why you name it something else? You can change the name. It's still mine. And eventually, I'm going to ask for an account of it. And you think you got it until I take it. You think it's yours. I'm telling you, your enemy thinks that he owns something. As soon as you learn stewardship, God's going to transfer that thing from him to you. He's building it big, and he's taking care of it, and he's dressing it up. And eventually, God's going to make him, because, you know, it belongs to the king. He can just say, okay, that's long enough for that. I'm going to give this to him. No other system can do that. A king, he said, that's mine. I will just take this from him and give it to him. Saul thought he could hang on to the kingdom forever, but he became a bad steward. He kept things God told him to destroy. And the Bible says that Samuel came to him and said, God has ripped the kingdom from your hands. I want you to understand something. I can't say this. Listen, okay, I, I need a couple of minutes here. I'm going to finish by my time on 1130. Just, just, I'm going to get you out of here. Listen, listen. Sometimes when you lose something, the devil didn't take it. Sometimes God took it. You need scripture to prove it? All right, Luke chapter 19. Well, the first one I just read. Anyway, Luke 16, the whole thing. You're losing the stewardship. 
That's what Jesus told the disciples. He said, listen to me. I want you to understand. I know you think everything is groovy. You start wasting my stuff, I got to give it to somebody else. Why? Because my intention is not surviving and everybody have a little something. My intention is that it will continue to expand. I have a kingdom that I want other people to know about it. And in your hands, it just sits there. And in his hands, it'll grow. I need to get it in his hands because you're wasting it. You start handling your stuff like it belongs to the Lord. You're going to put yourself in a place where God is going to cause multiple things to happen for you. It's going to expand for you. So the devil's not always the one taking stuff away. Luke chapter 19, the parable of the stewards, the guy, the parable of the talents, the guy gives one guy 10, one guy five, and one guy one. The guy who had 10 multiplied it and gave, they gave him 10 cities. Y'all know the story? They gave the second guy five talents and he multiplied it, got five more. And, and the Bible says that Jesus said, good and faithful steward, good and faithful servant. The guy who had one buried it and did nothing with it. Now, he's only got one. And the master comes back and says, why didn't you invest my money so it can grow? Let that just sink down into your spirit. He said, hey, wait a minute. Take the one away from him and give it to the one who has ten. Your governments now on the earth tell you this. Let's take it from the rich and give it to the poor. Jesus said, that's stupid. They don't know how to do nothing with it. Take it from the poor. Give it to the rich. Ooh. Really? I know because we got to read the Bible. Luke chapter 19. The man who multiplied it. God said, give it to him. He said, and the guy who's got one. He said, take it from him and cast him out. He don't know what to do with it. He just sitting there with it. Listen, I don't think we understand. See, we think that God will give us stuff because we beg and then let us hang on to it as long as we want. And then we ain't doing anything with it except for self-indulging. My hair is done. My nails are done. I got Starbucks every day. But when the preacher get up and start talking about money, we like, they always ask him about money. I'm trying to save you from when God comes to make the account. I don't give Starbucks before I give Jesus. I don't give Starbucks before I bless my church. I don't give Starbucks before I make sure we got what we need up in here. I steward it by the order God has demanded. God said, give me first. I will multiply what you give. I need the tithe and I need the offering. And I will multiply and make sure you stay protected. But in the world system, if you live with them, you are going to remember this. The earth system is cursed. So if your money ain't under the kingdom, your money is cursed. It's a cursed system. That means it operates by man's power. God's system operates by God's power. I'm preaching in here. Do I have any friends left? I'm, I'm trying to tell you, this shifted my entire life. It shifted my entire life. Listen, I'm telling you now, it don't matter what you make or what you don't make. You start understanding stewardship, we have a responsibility to advance God's kingdom with all that we have. That is the first priority, and then you may enjoy the rest. Oh, it feels good to lay in my house knowing I have not robbed God. It feels good driving the car I drive, which is not a new car anymore. It was back when I bought it. But I know it's painful, number one. And number two, I ain't robbing God to have it. We rob God to try to look blessed instead of be blessed. If I had a binge right now, you'd probably be like, well, that pastor is blessed. I'm blessed anyway. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God, listen, God sends me around the world to do what I got to do. And wherever I travel, the people who bring me there, they have to pay everything to get me there. I don't have to have no money in the bank. God said, I'm sending you over there. They're going to pay to get you there. They're going to feed you while you're there, put you in a hotel, and send you back home. You don't need nothing. Go, go without nothing, he told his disciples. You don't need nothing. Oh, gosh, I got to finish. I got to finish with something nicer, though. Oh, I got three minutes. Okay. Please don't be mad at me. I, I, I'm walking on, on a tightrope right now because I know you, you, you're like... Pastor, you talk about my money. <laughs> Listen, all your finances should be prioritized and purpose to promote the kingdom with everything you produce. Glorify God 
influence, pe- uh, influence the world, attract people to the kingdom, reach people for the kingdom, touch people for the kingdom, and impact all the world and the people with what heaven has. What are your resources for? It's not so you su- t- for you to survive until you can't breathe no more. That's not what it's for. Think about it for a second. When you die, somebody's going to spend your money. Saving is the devil's greatest deception. Why are you holding on to everything God said to give up? He don't need all of it. He says, here's what I need, and this is what I need, and then I will bless you so much that you can't even count it. I believe that. I believe that for you. I don't know if you believe it. I believe that for you, and I believe that for me. God wants me to have what I need to have because I got people to reach and I got places to go and I got stuff to do and books to print and TV shows to produce so people can understand that God loves them. And if we don't get off the money, we're not going to be able to reach nobody. The devil funds his kingdom. Church people are like, they always want your money. Yeah, see, 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 we we can't be afraid of that. The The devil's paying for his stuff. He's making them rich and famous and killing them, by the way, at the same time. He's using them. And then we, they pollute the airways and make everybody rich and famous. And then we idolize them because they're rich and famous. And God said, here's what I want you to understand. All of that stuff is mine. And there will be an account. And I want you to understand, though you may be saved, fully saved, fully righteous, your stuff is not. It's cursed until you give it the way God said to give it. By the way, the tithe breaks the curse off your money. Malachi chapter 3. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'm not dealing with tithe today. I'm just telling you that's what it does. Tithe doesn't multiply. It breaks. You go out in the world system and the spirit of the world, you, you, you take money from the system. And then you just use it and it's cursed. You got to bring a portion of it and move that whole thing into the kingdom. How do you do that? All you need is a portion that represents the whole. So if I had a million dollars, God don't need a million. God needs me to give him the representation to show him I made a million. So I give him 100,000. He says, okay, I know you earned a million. I'm going to bless the other 900. You show me that. And so the 900 that is blessed is better than the one that I, if I would have kept it. 90% blessed is always better than 100% cursed. The devil hates this message because you're about to be blessed. So this is what we do. Play me something, Brother DJ. This is what we do. I hope y'all are still my friends. I got to keep it real so y'all can be blessed. Listen, this is, what we, this is what we do, okay? In the world system, here's how we do it. We don't purpose our stuff for God's kingdom first. What if you did that? You are, that's correct stewardship. Unjust stewardship is blessing me first. He told the steward, he said, you're wasting it. What does that mean? You're spending it on cheer and joy, and movies, and Netflix. Meanwhile, the real thing that the world needs is the kingdom, and we just think God's going to do it. He'll do it. God's got it. Instead of contributing. See, if you got $10, you give on a percentage. It's simple. If you got $10,000, you give on a percentage. It's very simple. God makes it so everybody has the same sacrifice, not the same amount. But here's here's the thing that we do, though. Because we don't, remember we're talking about the spirit of stewardship? This is what we do. We don't think about it, so we seek God to get more money instead of taking the money to get more God. Don't we? We go to God, God, I need more money, the bills are due, I need more money, I got this to pay God, God, please, 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 please. Instead of taking what you have now and blessing it so that people can get more God from it, empowering the gospel. And God said, now you're going to be taking this. Listen, this is what I put people on the earth so they can know me, not so we can survive. If you do that first, don't come to me asking for money. Take what I gave you and get people more of me. And now you're thinking like a steward. Oh, God will take care of me. I'm protected. If I'm a steward, I'm covered. If I got the keys and know how this garden works, I'm good. If you're in a terrible situation right now, I'll tell you what I used to do. Every time something would come up, I sow a seed. That's what I do. They wouldn't let me off for Sundays, and I couldn't go to church. I took my envelope, put me an extra seed. I had my tithe already set. Took my extra seed and wrote on the back of my envelope. Said, Lord, I need financial increase, and I need them to let me off on Sundays because I ain't going to be missing church all the time. 
Ain't it, ain't it sad that, they, they, that the world has figured it out? They love money so much, we'll make them work on Sundays, and they'll go for the extra money. They won't even, they'll play baseball. They'll send their kids to AAU and skip church. And then I got them because they'll never learn. We love money. We don't love God. Y'all love God. Some people don't. Not you. But see, every time you get paid, there's a test. God said, you still love me? It's Friday. No, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. He ain't talking about starting a soup kitchen. Empower the gospel. Feeding the word. Empower. They won't need no soup kitchen if they get the gospel. We got those because we ain't got enough gospel yet. We can put all that out of business if everybody gets empowered. I'd love for everybody to be so blessed they don't need to get in that line no more. You see what I'm saying? All right, I'm done. Hallelujah. Can you stand on your feet all over this place? Let's bless the Lord one time. Hallelujah. We are talking about a subject. I got four hand claps. Lord, help me. Where's my security? Jeff, walk me out. Hey, it's an easy thing. God ain't mad at you, but I'm telling you this. God watches over his stuff. You are perfectly righteous, no doubt. Manage your stuff the way God said so that he can bless it. I'm going to show you more about the details, but the spirit of a story. He won't worry. Put your mind on what God has for you. Start with the level. I don't care. You got two pennies in your pocket. Start giving. You'll give your way out of that. Start. And give with faith today. Give with faith. I don't care if you got a quarter in your pocket. When you give it, you say, God, this is big. Somebody got $1,000 in here and they're supposed to give it. And he said the widow gave more than ever, all these rich people because she gave out of her livelihood. Give on your level. And look, when you give it, say, God, I thank you that I'm blessed. I thank you that the windows of heaven are open, open for me this week. I thank you that you're going to move me to higher levels of resources so that, not so I can want money, so that I can make an impact and empower the gospel. So that I can empower, so people can look at me and say, God blesses people. God don't want people looking at us and say, boy, they, that's dumpy. Look at them. They're struggling on every front. No, God said, I want you to see them and say, look at them. They're blessed. Just, just think about it. Say, I'm going to be blessed. I'm not afraid of being blessed. And I want you to be blessed. And that's the word of the Lord. All right. Hold your giving high in the air. This is what I'm giving today. <laughs> this paper in here. talk about it later <laughs> thank you though all right hold your hold your wallet high in the air your phone whatever whatever you give with do what the lord tells you to do father we thank you that we will obey what it is you tell us to do today given on our level given by faith knowing that you have not withheld any good thing from us god we're just simply operating in the right system now with no fear we know that it ain't about what's in our accounts today. You can bring money from unexpected places. You can bring a car like you did for me from someone who just has it. We're not limited to buy, buy our jobs anymore. That's one, one stream, God. Now we're taking uh, an account and in, in moving into the kingdom. So God, we bless the gifts and the givers today. And thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness as we give. In Jesus' name. Can you shout amen? Amen. 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 God bless you as you give. And I'll see you next Sunday as we take it farther. Oh,